Acts. Uh, if you recall, last summer we, we went through the book of Ephesians, and we went through the book of Ephesians because it's a very church-centric book, uh, and to kind of encourage uh, this young church plant. Um, but then we decided to go through the book of Acts this summer because uh, we realized that when you're a year out and you start looking like a church, there's some things that happen, right? We kind of fall into these kind of routines and like it's, it feels like church. And so going through the book of Acts uh, is great because it reminds us that the things that are happening within the church uh, are not by our own effort. It is by the Holy Spirit moving in and through us. In our capacity to hear and walk and step with the Holy Spirit and living in that faithfulness is why God will ever add to our number. And so um, we're in the book of Acts. Uh, turn to your Bibles. We're going to be in chapter 4, verse 32. And we're going to be going through the end of chapter 4 uh, into chapter 5, verse 11. And this is the uh, 10th installment in this message series that we're calling The Unfinished Story. And the title of today's message is actually a question that I'd like for us to consider. Church, can we do better? Can we do better? And to answer this question, we're going to need to face perhaps a startling truth. We're going to need to come to the realization that the church isn't perfect. The church has its flaws the church has its shortcomings. And it's not God's fault. The responsibility is solely on us. So we're going to need to take a long, hard look at the good, the better, and the ugly. Now you're probably wondering or probably thinking that this is going to be one of those messages. Well, bear with me this morning because it may not initially be uplifting, but I do believe that God uses passages and messages like this to keep us grounded. God uses passages and messages like this to remind us that we're, we're not all that we're cracked up to be. In fact, as we heard a couple of weeks ago from Pastor Ed, we need passages and messages like this because we, we often consider ourselves more highly than we ought. And it's this temptation this, this often lofty, self-righteous, holier-than-thou attitude that's been the church's reckoning. Because you see, the church has an image issue. Who we say we are doesn't always match up with how we say we live. Now, I've seen this meme on my Facebook feed a little too often. It's a picture of Mahatma Gandhi with an alleged quote saying, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. The church is full of hypocrites, some have said. In Scripture, we see Jesus encouraging his disciples to consider their calling and ministry in the world, saying that they are the light of the world. They are the city on a hill. They are to be this bright and shining testimony of good deeds that gives honor to God. And yet, what we say doesn't always match up with how we live. This morning, I believe God has something to show us. I believe that God has something to say to us this morning. So let's take a look at this morning's passage. We're in Acts chapter 4, verse 32, to chapter 5, verse 11. And in it, Luke writes... All the believers were united in heart and mind, and they felt that what they owned was not their own, so they shared everything they had. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and to God's great blessing, and God's great blessing was upon them all. There were no needy people among them, because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. For instance... There was Joseph, the one the apostles nicknamed Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He was from the tribe of Levi and came from the island of Cyprus. He sold a field he owned and brought the money to the apostles. But there was a certain man. His name was Ananias, who with his wife Sapphira sold some property. He brought part of the money to the apostles, claiming it was the full amount. With his wife's consent, he kept the rest. 
Then Peter said, Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? You lied to the Holy Spirit and you kept some of the money for yourself. The property was yours to sell or not sell as you wished. And after selling it, the money was also yours to give away. How could you do a thing like this? You weren't lying to us, but to God. As soon as Ananias heard these words, he fell to the floor and he died. Everyone who heard about it was terrified. Then some young men got up, wrapped him in a sheet, and took him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, was this the price you and your husband received for your land? Yes, she replied. That was the price. And Peter said, how could the two of you even think of conspiring to test the spirit of the Lord like this? The young men who buried your husband are just outside the door and they will carry you out too. Instantly, she fell to the floor and died. When the young men came in and saw that she was dead, they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear gripped the entire church and everyone else who had heard what had happened. So what's happening here? Well, first, let's talk about the good. Here we're getting another rare glimpse into the early church's life in the book of Acts. And if you're familiar with this, it bears a striking resemblance to the passage that we saw in Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47. This is a passage that I had preached on previously. And if you remember from that passage, what we saw was a descriptive community of believers. A community of believers that was living right in that tension of the already but not yet. They were living in this, this faithfully urgent condition, excitedly anticipating the return of Jesus Christ the Messiah. These were believers that were devoted to the Word of God. These were believers that were devoted to prayer. They devoted themselves to extravagant generosity. They were united in like-mindedness, and their faithfulness was richly rewarded by God by adding to their number day by day by day. And so we see here something very similar. What we're seeing is something that's very good. Look at what Luke writes. He says, all the believers were what? United. They were united in heart and mind. And they felt that what they owned was not their own, so they shared everything they had. Listen to what's at the center of their attention. The apostles testified powerfully to what? The resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's great blessing was upon them all. So far, so good. We'll take a look at this further. Because this is not just a surviving community. This is a thriving community. Though there were no needy people among them. Why? Because those who own land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those who were in need. This is the light of the world. This is the city on a hill. This was the kind of church that was bearing witness to Jesus Christ. They were bearing witness to the poor, to the destitute, to the have-nots, right, to the forgotten ones. These believers were stepping up and stepping into opportunities to meet one another's needs. And what we see on display here are powerful acts of grace being extended to one another. Uh, one of the, the key strategic aspects of Restoration Church also happens to be a key rhythm for us, and that is to bless. At Restoration Church, we believe that when blessed people are in the neighborhood, the neighborhood should be what? Blessed. Amen. What that means is we want to consider very carefully how we address the physical, emotional, and spiritual needs of our community. We believe strongly that if we, if we take care of the out there, God's going to take care of the in here. That's why we annually participate in things like Thanksgiving outreach. Many of you have participated in that. 
for the 20-some families that are eligible for free and reduced meals here at Fields Road Elementary School, as well as the community that's at Hidden Creek, we put together full Thanksgiving meals so that in that critical holiday season, when a lot of people experience loneliness and sadness, everyone in our proximal sphere of influence can enjoy a full Thanksgiving meal. Amen? We believe in we believe in that. We also believe in, and you participate very simply in, the feeding of students and their families by checking into Facebook. Something so easy to do. We want to even increase our impact that we make with Fields Road Elementary School by, by encouraging you folks, and we're going to talk about this in a little bit, about sharing some of our posts so that we get more people that are participating in it. Because we partner with the Mana Food Center in their Smart Sacks program, which, by the way, is their most expensive program. And by partnering with Mana Food Center and the Smart Sacks program, we make sure that eligible students and their families get to eat for an entire weekend, all weekend long. Why do we do this? We do this because we understand that there's a need. There's a need. But we also do this because we understand that the grace that was shown us must also be extended to others as we love on our neighbors. We join God in the restoration of all things, desiring to see restoration in things like reconciliation, in beauty, in shalom, and in justice. And yet, church, we can do better. We can do better. So let's take a look at the better. What we see in this passage is a, is a common kind of fleeting introduction of a character that'll make big waves later. We see that his name is Joseph, verse 36. His name is Joseph, who was also nicknamed Barnabas. Now, for those of us who might not know who Barnabas is, he later becomes a very significant influence as a missionary and as a preacher for the kingdom. But for the purposes of this narrative, Luke's mention of Barnabas serves as a climax to the story. This Barnabas, whose name means son of encouragement, does just that for us this morning. He encourages us. Because you see, while Barnabas may be mentioned almost 30 times in the New Testament, five times in Paul's letters, and across seven different chapters in the book of Acts, it's in this passage, this passage, that may be the only in a series that is devoted completely to him. Why? We know he's a Levite, which means that he's in the same family as Moses and Aaron. We know he's from Cyprus, which is a group of islands that is just west of Israel. We also know that he owns land, right? Which means that he isn't without means. But what else do we know from Barnabas? If you look into Acts chapter 11, verse 24, you find that Barnabas was a good man. He was full of the Holy Spirit and that of faith. No wonder he's called the son of encouragement because by his ministry, many were added to the Lord. But it's this good that marks this man. And this brings me to the reason that I believe God begins to name names in this passage. To say Barnabas was a good man is to get a, to get a, get a, kind of a bead on, on where his heart is. This man was full of goodness. He was generous. He was charitable. But we also know from verse 31, he was also filled by the enabling power of the Holy Spirit. What he was capable of doing was found in the obedience to this enablement of the Holy Spirit. That is, he heard and he walked in step with the Spirit. Which brings us to verse 37. What he owned, he sold. And what he sold, he gave. You can only do that if you are being enabled by the Holy Spirit. Check out his heart attitude when he brings his gift. He places it at the feet of the apostles. The least shall be great. The last shall be first. You know, I got to tell you that um, I struggle with this. I'm an extremely competitive person. I'm in it to win it. 
That is my thing. I hate losing. On some days, I think my name is Ricky Bobby. If I'm not first, I'm last. Uh, even when it comes to ministry, I am fiercely, fiercely competitive. I want to win in ministry. I know that sounds strange, but I, I want things done well. I want things done right. I want things done perfect. Right? I spent 15 minutes just making sure the crinkles on the curtain were just right. But in that striving to be the best, there's a danger of pride. What I have to give, I don't always lay at the foot of God. Instead, I present it proudly, as if it's something that God should marvel at. That's silly, right? Very silly. And yet I think some of us struggle with the same thing. And this is precisely what gives the church the reputation that it's unfortunately have, has earned. We care more about what we're doing. We care more about what we're accomplishing. We care more about what we have accomplished, rather than being obedient to the Holy Spirit. You've said this on countless occasions. The heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. Now certainly, I don't want to overgeneralize. It's not all good, but it's not all bad either. But if our actions aren't in alignment with our commitment, we will earn this reputation. But there's hope. We can change that, and we can change that today. Barnabas' heart was firmly fixed on the advancement of the kingdom. He humbly presented the proceeds of the sale of his land to the apostles for them to distribute. And for that, his name is recorded in the book of life. How does the testimony of Barnabas stir us today? How does his example of hearing and walking in step with the Spirit inspire us today? What sacrifices are we willing to make? What acts of generosity are we willing to extend? Let us take care and love our neighbor. Let's, let us take care and love our fellow brothers and our sisters. Let's not just tolerate one another, right? but receive one another in genuine love. All the faults, all the pockmarks, all of it. Instead of arguing with one another over our differences, let us embrace one another in our sameness, in our shared humanity. And now this. You knew it was coming. It's the ugly. I'm going to spend a little time on this. If Barnabas was the climax of the story, then this next section is the denouement. It is the wah-wah sad trombone. Luke writes, but, and anytime we see a but or we see a however, we know a big transition is happening, a huge contrast. Luke writes, but a man named Ananias. You know, there's, there's a couple reasons why your name gets found in the good book. Either you done really, really good, or you done really, really bad. And we're about to hear the latter. A man named Ananias with his wife, Sapphira, uh-oh, sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge, a.k.a. she was complicit, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the, the apostles' feet. Well, at least he laid it down properly. What do you think happened next? Yeah. No, not that. <laughs> I mean, let's remember the context here. Ananias dared to bring his partial offering before Peter. I mean, capital A, Apostle Peter. Okay? This is the guy, I don't know, only walked with Jesus for three years of his life. Right? This is, this is uh, the guy that Jesus named The Rock before Dwayne Johnson was The Rock. Okay? <laughs> this is the guy who only a chapter ago healed a fully grown man who was lame since birth. And Ananias decides he's going to try to pull a fast one on Peter. Now what is Peter going to do here? He's going to exercise some supernatural discernment. Look at what Peter says next. 
Why has Satan filled your heart? And just so Ananias is clear, because he thought he was going to get away with lying to Peter. But Peter says, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to what? To who? Not Peter. To the Holy Spirit. The heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. Brothers and sisters, now I want to, I want to preach a feel-good message just like anybody else. But if we're being honest with ourselves, the struggle is real. The struggle is real. We may look at Ananias and the judgment meter in our heart begins to elevate, it begins to increase. But be careful. Let's take the log out of our own eye before we judge the speck in our brothers. What we see next ultimately is that God is the judge because God in his goodness is ultimately just. So let's take a look at what, what it is that he did so wrong. Okay, so Ananias and Sapphira kept back for themselves a part of the proceeds of the land that they sold. Is that wrong? Look what Peter says. He says that property was yours to sell or not sell as you wished. And after selling it, the money was also yours to give away. In other words, whatever, whatever. God has blessed you with this stuff. You could do with, you could do with it whatever you pleased. You could have sold it or not sold it. You could have given the money away or kept it. It was really neither here nor there. But look back at verse 2. Ananias, in, in chapter 5, verse 2. Ananias and Sapphira, Sapphira, as one translation puts it, colluded. They colluded. That is, they knew something with one another that others did not. The mistake was bigger than that, though. Here's what Peter says. He says, you weren't lying to us, but to God. You weren't lying to us, but to God. As a parent, it's hard. Uh, raising children is, is tedious. Uh, it requires so much physical and emotional energy. Uh, so before my son Jude was born, my wife and I uh, vowed to keep things real simple. Yeah, all right, that was foolishness. Um, we prayed for both of our kids, and we attempted to discern a vision of parenting for our kids. Now, since Jude was the first, he was going to be the guinea pig. <laughs> In our house... Okay, this is how simple it is. In our house, we have two rules, and you might even consider them being the same rule. Respect your parents and don't lie to us. Respect your parents and don't lie to us. Everything else, fair game. Fair game. Because we knew, we knew eventually someone was going to draw on the wall with the crayons. We knew eventually someone was going to spill milk all over the kitchen floor. And we knew eventually someone was going to punch someone in the face at school. Real story. <laughs> IRL, IRL. We get it. We make, we make mistakes. We struggle with making bad choices. And you know, I've only mentioned the H word once. But what we're seeing in this passage here is hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. The practice of claiming to have moral standards or beliefs to which one's own behavior does not conform. In other words, the walk doesn't match the talk. We struggle with this. My kids struggle with this. And you know, as a parent, I like to think that I'm fair. I like that, to think that I'm just with my kids. And so when Jude does something wrong, I don't, I don't want him to pretend that he's a good kid and would never do something wrong. He's a boy. He makes foolish mistakes because he's a boy. And I know these things about him. I also was once a boy. But all I ask for him to do is respect his parents and not lie to us. Come clean and if you come clean, the punishment for the crime is much, much less if you just simply confess with a repentant heart. But of course, he lies. And that's what we do. Because we think we're getting away with something. 
We lie because we think we're getting away with something. But here's the thing. God knows. God knows. The person you're lying to may not know, but God knows. You're not lying to me. You're lying to God. What happens next to Ananias might be unsettling for some of us. It might be unsettling for some of us who believe that God is just love. But I want us to consider this. God isn't just love. God is intrinsically good. He is good. In his word, we understand that the wages of sin is death. And so I tell my kids, I don't tell my kids that per se, but I say, if you do bad things, that would scare them to death. If you do bad things, bad things are going to happen. That's not to say that if you do good things, good things are going to happen. But if you do bad things, bad things are going to happen, especially if those actions serve to harm. Right? We reap what we sow. And so make no bones about it. When you lie, you are inflicting harm. It's a form of deception, lying is. The intention of lying is to mislead. We purposely withhold vital truth from someone that, that, that prevents them from making an informed decision. It distorts. Lying leads people astray. So as soon as Ananias heard these words from Peter, he fell to the floor and he died. Now, I don't, I don't, I don't want to say that this is exactly how God is dealing with sin today. That is, if you sin, you're going to instantly die. That's not for me to know fully. However, I do feel it's important for us to be clear about what we're reading here. Just as we see how radically faithful some of these believers, early believers, are living in light of the imminent return of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, we're still in this period of time where God has inaugurated a new way of dealing with his people, specifically through the intervention of the Holy Spirit. This is also a, criti a critical juncture in kingdom history, as the early church begins to find its feet and position itself at the center of changing the course of history. So we've seen other believers, specifically Barnabas in this passage, hearing and walking in step with the Spirit. And sometimes that draws us into the notion that this early church somehow could do no wrong. But the reality is we get to see that what afflicts the church today afflicted the church then. As much as it is a problem in the church today, it was a problem in the church then. Hypocrisy exists. Why? Because we are fallen people. We are flawed. We are not intrinsically good. We are intrinsically self-motivated. We are intrinsically self-centered. We are intrinsically egocentric. Our natural bent is towards our own personal agenda, our own status, our own gain. If that's not clear with Ananias, look at what happens next. At a, after an interval of about three hours. Where was his wife for three hours? His wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Now, her not knowing what had happened is not really important here to note. It's the fact that what we see is that his wife is complicit to the deception. Peter gives Sapphira a chance to come clean, but she does not. He says, was this the price you and your husband received for your land? She said, yes, that was the price. To that, Peter says, how could the two of you even think of conspiring to test the spirit of the Lord like this? Make no mistake, in our minds, we're first. In our minds, we're first. At which point, Peter reveals that what befell her husband is unfortunately going to befall her. And to be honest, I, as I said, I don't know why Ananias and Sapphira's uh, fate was what it was. Perhaps the old adage is true. Uh, one bad apple, in this case two, spoiled a lot. Perhaps it's the warning that Jesus gave to his disciples when he said, Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees. 
Their hypocrisy, he says, Luke chapter 12, verse 1. Now, for, for us culinary folk in the audience, we know that a little bit of yeast goes a long way. Yeast expands and affects everything it touches, just like hypocrisy in the church. Ananias and Sapphira had the appearance of commitment to God, but it wasn't true in them. They said one thing, and they did holy in another. Church, we can do better. We can do better. Luke closes this passage by restating the response from those who witnessed it and those who eventually heard about it. And in it, we see the first mention of the word church. This is the first time we see the word church in this context. Luke writes, great fear gripped the entire church and everyone else who heard what had happened. You see, fear is a good thing. In Scripture, it says that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Wisdom to avoid evil. Understanding that God has our good in His mind. Who knows why Ananias or Sapphira were holding on to a portion and declaring it as the whole? But in a time when it was important that the community of believers hear the Spirit and walk in step with the Spirit, it wasn't the reputation of the church that was on the line. It was the reputation of the one to whom they had declared their devotion. Now for us today, for while there is a distinction between those who are hypocrites and those who struggle with hypocrisy, the need to confess our sins and repent is the same. The need for grace and forgiveness is the same. The need to turn from our sin, hear and walk in step with the Spirit is the same. In that way, Mahatma Gandhi is right, whether he said that quote or not. We are very much unlike our Christ. You know what I say to that? Praise Jesus. Thank God that Jesus isn't like me. Because my salvation would be void if he was like me. Intrinsically, I am no saint. I'm not holy on my own. I'm not perfect, some say. But that's why I desperately need a perfect Savior. That's why I need the perfect Lamb who is the only adequate sacrifice for my sins. The only thing that I'm perfect at is being imperfect. This perfect, holy Jesus defeated death. And that's where I find my victory. That's where we find our victory. This is where I find the hope that my walk will eventually align with my talk. That alignment starts with, starts with us hearing and walking in step with the Spirit, training ourselves towards that goal. Avoiding hypocrisy isn't going to be possible without God's grace. And that's why it's so often that we point to the rhythm of listening. Learning to hear God's voice, and not just hear it, but obey it. So let's do that today. I challenge us today. Let us commit to listening today. Listen to his word. Listen to God's word. As Pastor Ed has said many times in the past, if we would just begin to read his word with regularity, our life will change. And yet I know... I do know that it is difficult for some of us. It's difficult for some of us to understand. We may flip open the Bible and find ourselves in a genealogy. I don't know what to do with a family tree. <laughs> you turn the page, right? But here's what I want you to do. I want you to connect with somebody. Connect with somebody in your community group.
connect with one of our ministry team leaders. Connect with a pastor or a pastor's wife. And then I want you to ask this very simple question. Can you help me with reading the Bible? It's that easy. We have a number of folks that are in group chats doing devotions in the YouVersion Bible app. I encourage you. I, I push us towards getting connected with somebody and start reading the Bible today. Listen to God's people. As you're in these Bible reading groups, share with one another. Share your hurts. Share your pains. Share your joys. Share the stories about how God is, is, is speaking to you and how you're beginning to take steps in victory. Share about how your steps are beginning to align with your devotion and encourage each other in that way. Listen to God's Spirit. What we read in the book of Acts is how the Holy Spirit is moving in and through the church to be the mechanism for history-changing global transformation. That's what we're seeing. And it happens in one person's heart at a time. God's Spirit may be pressing on your heart this morning. He may pray, be pressing on your heart this morning to confess and repent of some things. Maybe it's hypocrisy. Maybe it's saying one thing but completely doing something else. His Spirit is calling us out. So let us not lie to Him, but hear His conviction and walk in step with Him today. We looked at the good. We looked at the better. We even looked at the ugly. But there's one more thing we haven't looked at, and that is the beautiful. And I want to read this from one writer, and he says this. Christianity does not stand or fall on the way Christians have acted throughout history or acting today. Christianity stands or falls on the person of Jesus, and Jesus was not a hypocrite. He lived consistently with what he taught, and at the end of his life, he challenged those who had lived with him night and day for over three years to point out any hypocrisy in him. And yet, his disciples were silent because there was none. There was none. In the beginning, I asked church, can we do better? Now, throughout, I've been saying that we can do better. We can be better. But not because we can do what's impossible for us to do, but because God can do what's possible for Him through us. And I pray that this, this gives us hope today. I pray that we lean in and we hear the Spirit and we walk with Him. And day by day, as God begins to align our walk to be in step with our faith, that we give glory to God because it is He that makes it all possible. Not by our strength, not by our will, but His and His alone. Let's pray.